Beloved brethren, the title of this message is Embrace Tribulation. Embrace Tribulation or Embrace the Tribulation. <clears throat> and if that is your heart by the end of this message, then you have heard the word of the Lord and believed it and understood it and delighted in it, if by the end of this message you can embrace the tribulation that's ahead of us and you can see the goodness of God in it, because many are not going to see the goodness of God in it. As an introduction to this message, you turn to Luke chapter 18. I'd like to read to you a parable. Much of the end time environment, the environment of the last days is communicated to us by parables. Because such things cannot be communicated to man in any other effectual way. Luke 18, verse 1 through 8. And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not to faint saying, There was a city, there was in a city a judge, which feared not God, neither regarded man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, that will be the environment of the last days, of very specifically the last generation. Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith, and shall not God avenge his own elect? which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them. I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. I remember reading this long ago when I was newly converted as a Christian, and it staggered me that the Lord would say something like this, When I come, when the Son of Man comes, will He find faith on the earth? I didn't know much about prophecy or the last days or the last generation or how to tell when it's near, how to tell what is coming upon us, in what order, what can we expect, why is it coming, for what purpose, what is in the heart of a God, of God, a good God, a loving God, to bring such a terrifying tribulation upon the world? And brethren, the purpose of this message is a teaching that if haply God would enlarge our hearts to see what is necessary to be seen in the heart of God, that we might pray, always pray, and not faint in the midst of tribulation. You can see here in this parable that that which is immediately standing as an offense to cause the importunate widow to refrain from her pleading is the obstinate stubbornness of a vile man. Who fears not God, nor regards man. That will be the environment, the conflict of the last days, and especially the last generation. That will be what is the most 
perilous to the people of God. It's not so much the earth going to and fro like a drunken man. It's not so much the stars falling from heaven and the pestilences smiting nations and wars and rumors of wars turning the heathen into a frenzy. It's not so much all of these things that is perilous to the people of God. What you find in the scriptures, for example, like in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, when the Apostle Paul says, Perilous times shall come. What you find that he is speaking of is more specifically the wickedness and the depravity of human beings and backsliding Christians accelerating to a point which is bringing the people of God into amazement and astonishment. If you scan throughout the pages of the New Testament looking for this one characteristic of what was in the mind of the apostles and the inspired writers when they thought upon the circumstances of the last days, and by what means would they encourage themselves to embrace tribulation, and you'll find that they were speaking on how perilous it shall be when mockers shall come, and scoffers, and they shall depart from the churches of God, and accelerate in wickedness and betrayal. You can find it in context in 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 1. You can find it in context in 2 Peter chapter 3 Verse 3, where the Apostle Peter, just after expounding this terrible apostasy that was happening in chapter 2, he says, knowing that first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, scoffers, that shall begin and originate inside of the church, and then, through apostasy, shall depart and become mockers. This is the mind and the context over and over again. I stated in second, second Timothy chapter three verse one, second Peter chapter three verse three. You can find it again in second Timothy chapter four verse three. And he says, with these heavy words, the time will come. And again, he has in his mind this terrible time, this terrible and awful generation when men shall keep to themselves teachers having itching ears and will no longer endure sound doctrine. Sound doctrine becomes as a plague to the mind and as a pestilence to the soul of scoffers and backsliders and apostates. They cannot endure it nor those who stand for it. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 speaks of it this way, and he words it in this wording, a falling away first. That, that is what must come. A falling away first. And a man cannot fall except that he was standing. He cannot fall away in sec except that he had a point of standing from which to fall away. And the writer, the Apostle Paul in Second Thessalonians chapter 2 speaks of this awful hour. But he that led it, that is, the Holy Ghost, is taken out of the way. In the midnight hour, of darkness takes its full blackness upon humanity. You'll find in that hour, parabolically speaking, Jesus Christ addresses it in Matthew chapter 25 in the parable of the ten virgins of God. And in that hour, 
the midnight hour, the darkest hour of the night, you'll find they're sleeping. They're all slumbering. The Apostle John stated in 1 John chapter 2, verse 18, speaking again in context of those that originated in good standing in a true and biblical church of God, then departing by the violent and aggressive overcoming power of what they called the spirit of the Antichrist. He said, quote, whereby we know it is the last time. In 1 John 2, verse 18. Again and again, brethren, you find the writers forewarning the people of God of this most specific and perilous aspect of the last days. And Jesus Christ Himself also, in Matthew chapter 24, addressed it in specific. You turn there. Matthew chapter 24. We start, we start reading in verse 1. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple and His disciples came to Him for to show Him the building of the temple. This constructed and amazing architectural accomplishment, high-rising building. They're looking at it seemingly unshaken. Verse 2, And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as He sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto Him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? This is the question which is frames for us the context of Matthew chapter 24 where Jesus Christ enlarges upon the most specific prophesying of the last days and the most factual prophesying of the last days that is not communicated by metaphors or parables. The question is, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? They're asking Christ this because Christ spoke of the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple of God and the stones being taken off, not one still standing upon the other. The disciples are asking, when shall this be? You'll find Christ prophesying from verse 4 all the way to the end of the chapter. And you'll find Him prophesying this increasing progress of the pangs of His coming. But what you need to note, brethren, in verse 6, at the end of the verse, He says there, but the end is not yet. In verse 14 again, He says, then shall the end come. So Christ begins to prophesy of the events that shall precede His coming, and then the events which shall be upon the generation which will be alive at His coming. Those are two very different things. So those things which precede His coming, He addresses first in verse 4. It says, And Jesus answered and said unto, him, said unto them, Take heed that no man shall deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. 
And ye shall hear of rumors, uh, of wars, and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation, and he continues, for nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. The beginning of sorrows, which is another way of saying the beginning of the birth pangs of which are coming upon the world. Verse 9. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and kill you. You shall be hated for all nations, for, of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. We'll begin again in verse 8, brethren. Matthew 24, verse 8. Christ said, all these, these are the beginning of sorrows, the beginning of the birth pangs, which shall increasingly come upon the world like the birth pangs of a woman in the hour of her travail. These are increasing and progressive. And it says there in verse 9, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and deceive many. Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. He that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. That frame of thought continues into verse 15. He says, when ye therefore shall see. So when he said it in verse 14, then shall the end come. He is signifying the time of this end. And he says, when ye shall therefore see. See what? The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then, at this time, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of the house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. And But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe him not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, if it were possible, they should deceive the very elect. Behold, I told you before, wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. 
For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even of the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and in great glory. And He shall send His angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together His elect from the four winds. From one end of heaven to the other. Now learn, Christ says, in the light of all these things prophesied and calendared, now learn a parable of the fig tree, when its branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, ye know that its summer is nigh. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near. Even at the doors. Verily I say unto you. This generation. Shall not pass. Till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But my words. Shall not pass away. But of that day and hour. Knoweth no man. No not the angels of heaven. But my father only. But as the days of Noah were. So shall the coming of the son of man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field and the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. The one shall be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched, would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh who then is a faithful and wise servant, whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household, to give them meat in due season. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over all his goods. But and if that evil servant shall say in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming, shall begin to smite his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunken. The Lord of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him, and an hour that he is not aware of, and shall cut him asunder, and appoint his portion with the hypocrites. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. From this point onward, Christ goes in to four different parables in chapter 25 still describing the environment and circumstances of the last days, and more specifically, the last generation. He dedicates four subsequent parables, again, preaching the last days. <clears throat> A brethren, <clears throat> there's something very specific that we need to see here. If you look in Matthew 24, verse 32 through 36, there's a delineation given here. A delineation between knowing the day and the hour of Christ's coming, comparative to knowing the season of Christ's coming. The Lord Jesus is not saying that we cannot know the season or the generation. But He's saying that we cannot know the day 
or the hour. If you notice here, he says in verse 34, This generation shall not pass. This means that he's instructing his people with enough detail that as we watch these events unfold upon humanity, we will be able to discern if we are the last generation. We will be able to discern while we are yet alive that according to the word of God, which shall not fail, that we will be alive when Christ returns, if we are not dead. This is a profound teaching of Christ. And He told us this because that generation is going to need to be anchored in this storm that's going to come upon them. Daniel chapter 12 states that the tribulation that shall come upon them has never been since the beginning of the world. There shall never be another time like this. So brethren, we are called to know the season and the generation which shall be the generation at Christ's return. But what is the sign? The chapter opened up in verse 3. The question was, what is the sign of thy coming? And when shall these things be? And we see there in verse 14 and 15, the answer is clearly given. And there's one thing that we need to take away from this. The most apparent characteristic which marks the last generation. And it is when they see the Antichrist. When the Antichrist. Verse 15. The abomination of desolation stands in the holy place proclaiming himself as God. Then we know. The generation that is alive in that day shall be the last. That will be a glorious day, brethren. For those who embrace tribulation, for those who are embracing this judgment of God upon the world, it shall be a glorious day. Not a day of men who lack valiance. No. No. Not a day, not a happy day for men who lack courage. Not a happy day for men who love their lives. It will not be a happy day for them that fear man. Who are unbelieving. As it says in Revelation 21 verse 8. That the fearful and the unbelieving shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. But it shall be a day like the days of Gideon. And the assembly of 300 men. Soldiers at war without weapons with faces like bronze with courage that's undaunted, to face an army like a locust plague, without any fear at all. It'll be a day like that day. A day in the midst of imminent apostasy. A day in the midst of blackness and darkness and backsliders and betrayal. And that is the most painful and perilous thing about the last days, brethren. I'll point it out to you. It says, and then, many shall be offended, and betray one another, and shall hate one another, and many false prophets shall rise, and deceive many, and because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that endures unto the end, the same shall be saved. This is the most perilous thing about the tribulation, brethren. It's betrayal. This is not speaking of the betrayal of the heathen. The word many is spoken in verse 10. It says many shall be offended. The word many is spoken in verse 11. It says the false prophet shall deceive many. And the word many is spoken in verse 12. And it says the love 
of many shall wax cold. This address of these three different, these three minis that are written here is speaking of those who loved God authentically, genuinely, biblically. Those who love God, who are a part of the church of God. This betrayal is not speaking of the betrayal of the heathen who have always been at enmity against God and His people. This betrayal is speaking of that nearly inendurable fact of when your own beloved friend betrays your soul. The one that you walk to the house of God with. The one who David speaks of, which personifies the situation of Christ who is betrayed by Judas. When your friend who kisses you, betrays you. This will be a day when betrayal is attractive to those who love their lives. Because this will be a day when the people of God are being persecuted, killed, imprisoned, and the church of God will need one another more than ever. Spiritually, emotionally, financially, just to survive the suffering in that hour. The people of God will be so closely knit together by the, fur the purging fires of the furnace that when one or some or many betray, the consequences will be untold. It will scatter true biblical churches. It will send multitudes to prisons by the onslaught of slander, gossip, by the onslaught of men who betray others and turn them into the heathen authorities who have framed mischief by law. There will be deceivers. And that is the most painful thing about the Great Tribulation. It is upon the experience of this that Christ warns that the love of many shall wax cold. The title of this message is Embrace Tribulation. And this is one fact that is calendared in the events which are ahead of us, which I, over the years, have had a small taste of, and you all. And I can tell you, standing before here, in everything that I've experienced, this has been the most painful and the most difficult and trying. But in the mystery of godliness, brethren, in the mystery of godliness, there is a posture of soul of which I entreat you, which when you embrace this fact through the mystery of godliness, surrendering your soul to God as a faithful creator, this will not harm your soul as you think it would and as it has in time past, if you embrace it. If you embrace it. Much of this message, brethren, is about embracing tribulation, embracing judgment. And it's very much like the message that Jeremiah preached. Jeremiah was a prophet in the last generation of the people of God before the judgment of the Babylonian captivity upon the people of Judah. Jeremiah was a lonely prophet who was forsaken by family and friends, who was forsaken by the apostate generation to whom he was sent, who lamented his own situation by saying, Woe is me, for I am a man of strife and a man of contention unto the whole earth. If he had that mindset, he wouldn't have endured to the end. If he had that mindset of, woe is me. That is not the right mindset. 
But Jeremiah was strengthened by the hand of God, by the near presence of God. He was strengthened, and the people of Judah thought he was insane. The people of Judah thought he was insane because he preached that when Babylon is coming, the people should surrender. He preached that judgment was coming and that they should embrace it. He preached that Babylon was coming and you can't stop it and they're going to harm you and your children are you going to die and there's going to be terrible pain and God's going to destroy his people and annihilate his house and not one stone's going to be left upon the other, so to speak, and you've got to embrace it. And they hated him for it. They hated him. And there will be multitudes, brethren, who are so unprepared for what's going to come upon the world, they will be hurled into disillusionment because of the false prophets and the peace preachers. Men who think they cannot fall, nor ever will fall. Men who need not to watch and pray. Proud men, high-minded men, who think that they cannot die, they cannot be cut off, that no man can harm me. Men that speak peace, one to another, instead of preparation, and prayer, and the terror of the Lord, by which we would persuade many to turn to righteousness, brethren. Men who believe in unconditional, eternal security. Men who believe they cannot fall, will fall. Men who believe they do have nothing to take heed to, will not take heed. Men who believe they have nothing to prepare for, will not be prepared. Men who believe that they are unconditionally, without question, always ready, will be found unready. Brethren, beloved, God has delivered us from this plague that I speak of. God has delivered us from that. This is one of many plagues which is putting the people of God, God's ten virgins, to sleep. As you find in Matthew 25, verse 1 through 13. Again, at the end of that parable, you'll find in Matthew 25, verse 13, Jesus says, Watch therefore, watch therefore, this command of the living Lord Jesus. The same command was given to the disciples who were with Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane in the hour of His trial. In the hour where pangs were coming upon the Son of God. In the hour of his greatest trial and temptation where he had to embrace becoming the very object of sin, to becoming the very object of God's forsaking wrath. What did Christ say to them, brethren? He said, watch and pray that she enter not into temptation. And what we see there, brethren, is that those who did not watch and pray, who felt so proud and so high-minded that they were not alerted to any watchfulness and any prayer, and they could not deny the crying of their flesh, which wanted peace, it was they that denied Christ. Those that did not watch and pray, Denied the Christ they loved. They did. And that serves as a memorial before us of godlier men than we. Men who have seen more miracles than any of us could wish to see or hope to see. Men that saw more of the glory of God that all the prophets of the earth desired to be those men. And yet there, in the Garden of Gethsemane, finding themselves unprepared, unknowing of what was about to come upon them, they denied the Christ they loved.
I say all of this, brethren, to bring before your minds the gravity of the situation that is ahead of us. As if right now, at this very moment, you'll find mingled inside of your heart the very emotions of offense and fear and unbelief of which are there residing. And if you don't conquer them before this day comes, you may find them overtake you. Though this be the future, brethren, this future is not to come upon us by surprise. You'll find that as the exhortation given throughout the scriptures to the people of God, you can turn to Romans chapter 13. And you'll see there with the Christians of the New Testament that they are very conscious of where they stand in the calendared events which have been prophesied by Christ and the prophets. Romans 13, verse 11, he says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we have believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh and for the lust thereof. Notice what the Apostle Paul said. He said, verse 11, Knowing the time. He said, verse 12, the night is far spent. This is language that is bringing to their attention where they're standing. Because they, in that time, were experiencing the beginning of the last day's environment. It was coming upon them. And it's coming, it came upon them in the measure that it did. That they would write about it, preach about it, so we would be prepared for it. Because it passed on from them. And that day is very likely committed to us, brethren. Committed to us. Turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 1. The Apostle Paul opens up, not to the Romans... But the Thessalonians, and he says, verse 1, But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I write unto you. Notice he says again the word times, and he says the word seasons. Because, brethren, the New Testament Christians were aware of the season of Christ's coming. They were aware of the environment. Verse 2, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say peace and safety, then shall sudden destruction come. Shall sudden destruction come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye, brethren, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You're all the children of light, children of the day. A brethren, the Word of God says, Blessed is the man who is attending to the meats and the drinks and feeding the servants of God, preparing them with knowledge that they might embrace the circumstances of the last days. And as that, those blessed men, so are the blessed people who are hearing the Word of God, who are preparing their hearts, who are contemplating the future events. And you'll notice here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, he says this warning, Brethren, ye are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. 
Or in other words, that that day should overtake you by surprise. Now, brethren, there are deluding powers involved with the coming of this day. By the sheer intellectual power of your mind, understanding the factual statements of Scripture, you will not be able to discern the season or stay awake for the hour. Only by the presence of God, only by the Holy Spirit, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, the servant who says in his heart, My Lord delayeth his coming and turns to sin, which is spiritual drunkenness. Christ says he shall come in a day when he knows not of. Though he's well instructed in all of the prophecies, though he sat under the very apostles themselves, Christ will come in a day when he knows not of. There are deluding powers that are involved, putting men to sleep and waking men up. It's the influence of the Holy Ghost to sober your mind, to recognize the central factor of sleeping and being awake. And it's in the judgment of the Lord Jesus who He says that He walks in the midst of the lampstands of God, that He is the imminent and discerning judge of all of our hearts and all of our souls. He says in Revelation chapter 3, turn there to the church of Sardis. <clears throat> the church of Sardis, he says in verse 1, And unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that at the seven spirits of God and the seven stars, I know thy works, that thou hast a name that thou livest and art dead, be watchful, he says. Be watchful. And strengthen the things that which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard. And hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch. I will come on thee. As a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. This is a personalized threat to a lampstand which is authentic and real to the regenerated people of God that are presently backslidden in Sardis. He personalizes the very preaching of the last days. And though they live over a thousand years away from the last hour and the last generation, yet Christ is personalizing it to them. Because it stands as an example for us. These things are written for our examples. 70 AD came upon them because it was a typological forerunner of the tribulation, of the great tribulation which is going to come upon the last generation. God brought them through 70 AD as an inferior and partial fulfillment of the same judgments and woes which generate the coming tribulation which is ahead of us. And God wrote to them charges and rebukes and promises and words whereby if they took heed, they would endure, whereby we might read and learn and take heed and personalize it to ourselves. Brother, notice there he says, if they do not watch and pray, if they do not strengthen the things that remain, if they don't hold fast and repent and remember, he says they will, Christ will come in an hour that they know not of. And in verse 5, he speaks of blotting their names out of the book of life. Uh, brethren, this is our Christ. The beautiful. The kind. The merciful and loving. The anchor of our souls. The intercessor of heaven. The mediator on behalf of mankind. The great high priest. This is our Christ. And everything he speaks is good. 
Every judgment that he says is just. And we need a heart to embrace it. We need a heart to embrace it. And I want to help you do that, brethren. And I want to spend the rest of this sermon expounding different aspects of the last days which are not grim and are not dark, which are glorious. Which are glorious, brethren. I entreat you, brethren, that you would look into the window of prophecy and see it. See the beauty of it. And be prepared. As you've heard many times, brethren, in Matthew chapter 25, in the parable of the ten virgins, there's another company of men besides the ten virgins. There's another company of men and it is the friends of the bridegroom. These friends of the bridegroom were not sleeping. These friends of the bridegroom were conscious of the coming of the Lord. They were aware of the season of His arrival. They were conscious of the things which would forerun it. They were proclaiming to all those who were unaware of the coming of the Lord to wake up and to get ready for the bridegroom coming. And that was their proclamation. Brethren, this is an untold number an untold number of people who are deeply conscious of the coming of the bridegroom. And this number of people which shall forerun the second coming of Christ shall be used by the living Lord Jesus to spark the greatest revival that we have seen, that the world has seen since the first century. So that it will be as His first coming in an age of apostasy and darkness and all the plagues which prepared that generation for the ripeness of their judgment. There was a remnant, a remnant of the people of God that the Lord Jesus was investing in and keeping in His name and preparing them to be preachers in the midst of an apostate generation. And we saw them as chicks underneath the wings of our Lord. We saw them. And brethren, they were the preachers of the hour when God changed His mind towards the Jews and turned His face to the Gentiles. In an hour of apostasy, they were the prophets of the hour of apostasy. They were New Testament prophets like the prophet Jeremiah who rejected like the man of sorrows. And brethren, as we preach to you in time past how Christ spoke of His coming and His rejection and yet in the midst of it beautified a bride sent 70 men into the cities of which he would arrive at to preach and do signs and wonders, sent apostles into cities to preach beforehand, to cleanse the lepers, to cast out devils, to heal the sick, to raise the dead, preaching them the kingdom of heaven is at hand. These were the friends of the bridegroom that were preparing the people for his imminent coming. And brethren, they were full of power in the Holy Ghost. They were full of power in the Holy Ghost to create a quickening and alarm to wake up the remnant of God. In Matthew 25, verse 1 through 13, we can see that five of the ten virgins woke up and they were not fools. And they had wisdom from God, which means they endured the tribulation. 
they were effectually run upon by what's called the midnight cry. And that's what we see in the first century. When the apostles would go out, when the 70 would go out, when all the forerunning preachers would preach to prepare the way of the Lord for the reception of the bridegroom, and after the final works of redemption were done, thousands came to Christ. Thousands. Though the world rejected and forsook Him. Thousands came to Christ. And in that day, we see written in the pages of the Gospels and of the book of Acts, a bride that is beautified. Though she be so tried by suffering, though she be born in a day of tribulation and adversity, she was beautiful. She was beautiful, brethren. She is what Ephesians 5, 26-27 spoke of. A glorious church without spot or blemish, without wrinkle, beautified in holiness, wearing the beautiful garments of God, of Israel, prepared for her bridegroom. A brethren, there's something very shocking and amazing. After almost 2,000 years, the church of God has degenerated from that beautified estate. And we have declined into a day and hour of false prophets who don't even understand what the beauty of the bride is. Who don't even understand what a spotless bride is. Who have no idea what it means to be blameless and harmless. The sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation who are both unknowing and without care for the bride herself preaching peace through unconditional sermons of peace. God Himself never delivered a promise in any generation of any time before the first resurrection without the binding of a condition. Never, brethren. And we're in such an hour, brethren, such an hour of virgins that are sleeping, that upon hearing a sermon about preparing for the second coming of Christ, it would be so offensive and contradictory to their theology that they would be offended against it and write the men off and fall back asleep in their sin. The very idea of preparing, they account as heretical. The very idea which would make men ready they attribute it to be false teaching. This is the hour we're living in. 2,000 years have passed. And the idea of a beautified bride is almost outside of the memory of the virgins of God scattered on, a, on the hills in this world. And the word lukewarm has been a household byword of the communities of the people who profess faith in Christ. The word lukewarm, that Jesus Christ said that he would vomit them out of his mouth. When such a term, vomit or spew, was used in time past, it was used in Leviticus 18 describing the abominable nations of the land of Canaan, which were unbearable before a holy God. And yet men live without fear, blessing themselves in their hearts, saying, No evil shall come upon me, though they add drunkenness to thirst. Such an hour as this hour, brethren, and such a company of men that are being prepared is yourselves. You are the friends of the bridegroom. You and others like you, and other movements that are preaching the doctrines of Christ that we know not of in the four corners of this world, God is raising up this voice, this cry, but it will not be awakened by a mere sermon. They will not be awakened, these ten virgins, by a mere sermon, by mere explanation of what the Scriptures actually mean. There must be something else. There must be something else, brethren. 
Now, brethren, as I go through the prophecies that will describe the coming move of God, I want you to consider as an introductory statement, Revelation, Revelation chapter 7, starting in verse 9. <clears throat> After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude which no man can number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen. Blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? Whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore are they before the throne of God and serve Him day and night in this temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them, lead them unto the living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Hallelujah. A brethren, this innumerable company from every nation, tribe, and tongue are Gentiles. And it specifically states in this prophecy that they came out of great tribulation, meaning the great tribulation. There is going to be such a move of God in this last hour that the gospel, the true gospel, shall be preached unto the ends of the earth. Hallelujah! Not the false gospel, brethren. And the scripture speaks of a false gospel in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. A false Jesus, a false gospel, and a false spirit that is parading itself falsely in the name of God and Christ. That gospel has already been disseminated all around the world. That gospel is not saving men. That gospel is perverting men and making them children of hell. But this gospel, brethren, the gospel of the word of God, of the truth of God, shall go to the ends of the world. Now, brethren, I feel that I need to digress for a moment. Because many of you who are young in the Lord, and who are unacquainted with the teachings of prophecy, there can have a feeling in your heart where there's a reservation of giving your heart to some prophecy because it still maintains an element of mystery to your mind. And so you feel that you can't take joy in it altogether because you feel unconfident of your understanding of that prophecy. Now, brother, I want to speak to you about that because I read, I've been reading prophecy for 11 years now. And I've read it for, for many years throughout the major and minor prophets and I spent most of the time confused. Most of the time, it was so mysterious to me and I couldn't discern what the prophet was speaking about. I felt that I couldn't be confident about what I was learning or what I was thinking about or what to expect. I want to speak to you about prophecy, brethren. And specifically... The prophecy of the Messiah in His first coming, Christ in His first advent. <clears throat> Turn to Luke chapter 7, verse 22. You can start in verse 19. The emphasis is on verse 22. Verse 19 of Luke 7. 
And John, calling unto him, two of his disciples sent him to Jesus, saying, Art thou he that should come? Or look we for another? When the men were coming to him, they said, John the Baptist has sent us unto thee, saying, Art thou he that should come? Or look we for another? And in that same hour he cured many of their infirmities and plagues and of evil spirits, and unto many that were blind he gave sight. Then Jesus answering said unto them, Go your way, and tell John what things ye have seen and heard, how the blind see, how that the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the poor, and to the poor the gospel is preached. And blessed is he whomsoever shall not be offended in me. So two disciples of John come to Jesus Christ and they're wondering if he is the Messiah. And John the Baptist is apparently having a fit of doubt or a fit of uncertainty coming upon him. And Jesus Christ answers the question that was made by John the Baptist, the greatest of the prophets, which was delivered and communicated by two of his disciples. He answers the question by deed. And then tells them, go back and tell them what you saw. And the deeds that he did were the fulfillment of prophecies in the Old Testament. He said that he caused the blind to see, the lame to walk, the lepers were cleansed, the deaf heard, the dead were raised, and the poor received the preaching of the gospel. You see, John the Baptist was a student of Old Testament prophecy because he was one that looked for salvation. To them, salvation was prophesied in the coming of a Messiah. To us, salvation is consummated in the return of the Messiah. To them, to prepare for the coming of the Messiah, they would be studying the prophecies. And they would find, as sheer students, guided by the Spirit of God, studying the books of the Old Testament, they would accumulate the verses which described the coming of the Messiah, and they would prepare their hearts, if happily they live in the generation when He comes. And it said, in Isaiah 35, verse 6, that the Messiah would heal the lame. It said in Isaiah 43, verse 8, that the Messiah would heal the blind. It said in Isaiah 35, verse 5, that the Messiah would would Heal the deaf. It said in Hosea chapter 6 verse 2. Hosea chapter 13 verse 14. Isaiah chapter 25 verse 8. Isaiah chapter 26 verse 19. That this Messiah would have power over death and over the grave to raise men from the dead. It said in Isaiah chapter 6 verse 9 through 10. That this Messiah would be a baby child, and His name would be Almighty God. It was said that this Messiah did all these things, and even that He preached the gospel to the poor, that His main focus was the poor. You can find that in Isaiah 61, verse 1, Psalm 72, verse 13, and Zechariah, uh, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 12, that His focus of salvation would be to the poor. And that first and foremost means those who are poor in spirit. But you often find it, brethren, that those who are poor in spirit are also poor in the flesh. For how hardly shall a rich man inherit the kingdom of God? It is harder for the camel to go through an eye of a needle than a rich man to inherit the kingdom of God. And as James 5 states, the poor are blessed to be rich in faith. Rich in faith. Now brethren, all these things were prophesied. Thus, when John the Baptist heard report that in the very eyesight of these disciples, all of these miracles were done at one moment of time, the thronging crowds which were coming to this man, 
and he was healing them. He wasn't doing like Elijah or Elisha did, having to lay his body on the dead victims. He wasn't having to stand before a, a, a crowd of people or a situation of harm and stand and pause and inquire of the Lord or speak, thus saith the Lord. This Messiah touched men and they were healed. Commanded men to come from the dead and they would rise by spoken word with swiftness upon multitudes. More miracles than any of the prophets of the Old Testament did. When these men reported back that this was happening, they were understanding that these were the tokens of the Messiah. That no one but the Messiah could be doing these things. That being said, brethren, these prophecies, which I stated to you, almost every single one of them were in different chapters. Many of them were from different prophets who lived in different centuries and in different generations. And the only way to discern with clarity who this Messiah is, is by studying the prophecies with the guidance of the Spirit in humility before God, with such persistence that collecting inside of the mind is the characteristics of this coming Messiah altogether. And this is how we need to be, brethren. This is how we need to be. You need to be so acquainted with the situations that forerun the coming of the Lord that it is as if you're tasting it and seeing it already. So that when that hour comes, you shall be, as Isaiah 24 states, you shall glorify God in the fires. It's an amazing thing, brethren. The mystery of prophecy. The complexity of it. But yet, if you, as a child, just believe it, and study it, and become acquainted with it, and collect it together, the vision is so clear. The message is so apparent. The heart is moved by the Word of God. Now, brethren, God was not unrighteous to the Jews of the first century. It is, it is amazing how many prophecies were given that described the first coming of the Lord Jesus. There were over 20 prophecies that were given that were fulfilled in a 24-hour period. Over 20 different prophecies. Describing that he would, the, the amount of money that he would be betrayed for. Describing that his betrayal would come from one of his friends. Describing that the money would be cast into the temple. Describing that in the hour of his suffering, all of his disciples forsook him. Describing that he would be accused by false witnesses. That he would be smitten and spit upon. That he would be silent before his accusers. That he would be wounded and bruised. That his hands and feet would be pierced. That he would be crucified beside criminals, transgressors, and thieves. That he would pray for his persecutors. That the people would shake their head at him. That the people would ridicule him. That the people would be astonished while they're looking at him. And that they would part his garments and cast lots for them. And that he would cry out this cry. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That they would give him gall and vinegar to drink. That he would commit himself to God who judges faithfully. That he would afterward be redeemed and vindicated of all of their slanders. That his friends would stand afar off in fear. That none of his bones would be broken. That his side would be pierced. And that, that there would be darkness over the land at noonday time. All of these prophecies, brethren, and more were fulfilled approximately in a 24-hour time period. And they were scattered over hundreds of years of prophecy, of many different prophets, all prophesying of the same event. That is incredible, brethren. Before a cross was ever invented, the Roman cross... 
Jesus Christ is depicted in Psalm 22 with His hands and His feet pierced. The very crucifixion scene itself is depicted in Psalm 22. When Christ was being crucified there and all the whole scene was fulfilled and they were jeering Him and ridiculing Him and they said, if thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross and prove it to be true. And when He lifted up that cry in seeming defeat, Seemingly to confirm their accusations. That when they challenged Him to come down from the cross as a testimony that He was the true Messiah, He did not come down from the cross. And then He lifted up His face and He said, My God, my God, why hast Thou forsaken Me? It seemed as though that the accusations of the Pharisees and the Jews were confirmed to be true and He was dismayed. He was dismayed that God didn't bring him down from the cross. But any true Jew standing there looking on, who was acquainted with the Scriptures, whose mind was stayed upon God's law, who was full of the Holy Ghost and faith, considering all the prophecies, he would remember at the moment that cry was made, the very first verse of Psalm 22, verse 1, which is, My God, My God, why hast Thou forsaken Me? And it was the tradition of the Jews that when they would invoke the first verse of a psalm, that they would sing the psalms, and that the whole psalm would then come to the mind of any true Jew who was devoted to the Scriptures. And right there, as they were rebuking the Son of God and saying, Come down from the cross, he quoted the first verse of the psalm that depicted the scene that was before their eyes at that very moment. Hallelujah. Any Jew, upon hearing that verse, would remember the crucifixion scene and see it before their very eyes and be humbled before Almighty God. Brethren, that's the wisdom of an unsearchable and great and mighty king who prophesies the future before it comes. Amen. That is a title that only God has. Who tells the end from the beginning. Whose breath is not in his nostrils. Whose strength is not in flesh. The everlasting Father, brethren. Whose ways are higher than our ways. Whose thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And brethren, the reason I'm expounding these different aspects of the first coming of the Messiah is I'm trying by this, these words to shake you awake at how truthful, how inescapable, and how clear prophecy is. Every single word, every single statement, though it be embedded in a context of a historical situation, Though it be threaded together with many different prophets over the centuries, all declaring the same thing, embedded in different historical situations of the unfulfilled words of God. Brethren, they will be fulfilled. And when you read them, you should not have doubt in your mind or uncertainty. You should with holy reverence and worship understand that God is giving you the gems, the very puzzle pieces of this coming work that He's going to do that you might recognize and identify it. Brethren, there's many other prophecies, over 300 prophecies, that declare where He would be born, what He would do, what ministry He would have, how He would be received, where He would live. Brethren, many different prophecies. That he would have a forerunner, a prophet. That he would be like Moses. That he would purify the temple. That he would preach to the Gentiles. Many different prophecies. From his triumphal entry into Jerusalem. From people hailing him as Hosanna. From people recognizing his resurrection from the dead. And declaring it to the ends of the world. All these things are prophesied, brethren. The Messiah was prophesied. To suffer and die and rise again to conquer death and be the hope of the Gentiles and purchase the very world itself 
with his own blood, and asking the Father for the nations, and God gave them to him. Brethren, for a Jew to hear a prophecy like that, that would stop their mouth. They can't understand it. But we understand it, brethren, through the unction of the Holy One. We know our God. And I say all of this, brethren, to try to encourage you and inspire you to take seriously the prophecies of the second coming of Christ, that you would seek to understand it with such clarity, such familiarity, not merely the suffering, but the glory that should come, not merely the betrayal, but the revival that will take place. The, this move of God, this cry of the friends of the bridegroom, this preparation of the bride of Christ. Speaking of this, brethren, in the latter end of this sermon, I want to dedicate it to speaking of the glory of God, which will certainly come to pass in this last generation. You turn to Revelation, I'm sorry, Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11 is, in other words, a theological explanation of God rejecting the Jews, receiving the Gentiles, and then it prophesies of the receiving of the Jews again and the potential rejection of the Gentiles. Romans chapter 11 Verse 11, or we can begin in verse 7 through 10. What then? Israel hath not obtained that which she seeketh for, but the election hath obtained it, and the rest were blinded. According as it is written, God hath given them the spirit of slumber, as prophesied again in Matthew 25, the spiritual state of sleep. God hath given them the spirit of slumber, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear unto this day. And David saith, Let their table be made a snare, and a trap, and a stumbling block, and a recompense unto them. Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, and bow down their back all way. This is the condition of the first century Jews. Verse 11, he said, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation has come unto the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the rich of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. He goes on to explain the relationship of the fall of the Jews and thus the salvation of the Gentiles. But I want you to take note of that in verse 11. It says, for to provoke them to jealousy. If you look now, Romans 11, verse 25, begin reading again. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in fullness of the Gentiles, that great company of every nation, tribe, and tongue standing before the throne in Revelation chapter 7. Thus, for this reason, the gospel must go to the ends of the earth. Verse 26, it says, after the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. And concerning the gospel, they were enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. For as ye in time past have not believed, and yet have now believed, and now obtained mercy, through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. 
For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that He might have mercy upon them all. Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. Now, brethren, there's a very important verse I want you to see which hit me like an arrow shot from heaven a few weeks ago. Verse 31 said, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. Now, brethren, what you find in the, in the first century, in this typological example of what's going to come upon us, both in revival and in apostasy and in spiritual judgment, and in physical judgment. It's an inferior manifestation of what's going to come upon us for running the second coming of Christ. And as the friend of the bridegroom prepared the people, at his first coming, friends of the bridegroom are going to prepare the people for the second coming. There will be a great cry. It will go to the ends of the earth. The rejection of that cry by one half approximately of God's people will spark the great tribulation. Because it is at the rejection and rebellion of the people of God, rejecting their Messiah, it's only upon that simulation did any of these judgments in their inferior manifestations come to pass. The Assyria and Babylonian captivity were a judgment against the church. The 70 AD judgment was a judgment against the people of God, the church. And this final judgment, which is worldwide, which is the great tribulation, will be a judgment against the church, brethren. The Gentile church, which is worldwide, and against the heathen, which are bound together in the landslide of the declension of the people of God, because when the church of God darkens, when the lights go out in the church, the blackness of the heathen accelerates in wickedness, that's what's going to happen. They are directly correlating one with another. With the sleep of the church comes the darkness of midnight. But all throughout that sleep, brethren, there is this friendship, this company of bridegroom friends who, ironically now, we are in the wilderness like John the Baptist was for approximately 30 years or 25 years of his life until the day of his appearing to preach and forerun the this is the first coming of Christ. We are in a mysterious time, brethren, where we are being hidden away, hidden away by the walls of slander, by the walls of, of these coming pangs which will come upon the people of God worldwide, by the very stumbling stones which will one day offend masses of the people of God, namely the foolish virgins that don't awake in time. Do you know, want to know why I believe some were wise and some were foolish, brethren? The foolish virgins and the wise virgins were asleep in Matthew 25. The foolish virgins slept so much and were awake so little that when the day of trial came, they were unprepared. The wise virgins were awake enough and slept still, however frequently, and were found sleeping in that final hour. But they were awakened enough by the Spirit of God that when the cry came, they heard. Some of you backslidden brethren who have been on the hills for many years, who have stood beside men of God, and beloved brothers and friends of the faith who are now apostate. You can remember now those seasons of time when the Spirit of God visited you. You gave yourself to earnest prayer, to lonely pursuits of God, to study the Scripture. You gave yourself. You were awakened time to time. So when the word came for you to come join your brethren, and prepare to make this midnight cry, you heard. And this is happening all over the country right now. All over this world and preceding this last generation most of all 
when the power of the people of God will breach the fullness of the stature of Christ and they'll be enabled to make the midnight cry effectually worldwide. Brethren, at that time, the people of God will be prepared and the Spirit of God will be visiting the people of God to prepare them in that very same way. Turn to Isaiah 24. 13 through 23. In Isaiah 24, it speaks of the shaking of the olive tree, the season of the coming of the Lord. And it says in verse 13, When thus it shall be in the midst of the land among the people, there shall be as the shaking of an olive tree and as the gleaning grapes when the vintage is done. Then shall, they shall lift up their voice, it says. They shall lift up their voice and they shall sing for the majesty of the Lord. They shall cry aloud from the sea. Wherefore glorify ye the Lord in the fires, even the name of the Lord God of Israel in the isles of the sea from the uttermost part of the earth. Have we heard songs, even glory to the righteous? Brethren, do you see what this is saying? This is speaking of the great tribulation, the shaking that is coming upon the world. And at the very beginning of the introduction of this shaking that's going to come upon the world, it speaks of singing. Brethren, beloved of God, all over this world, singing Hallelujah. and giving praise to God from sea to sea and all over the islands everywhere, brethren, giving majesty and honor to the Lord Jesus Christ. Brethren, this prophecy will be fulfilled. And this is not where we are right now. This is what is to come. Brethren, this glorious reaping, this glorious midnight cry, this glorious move of God where this untold number is standing before the throne of God of the Gentiles. Brethren, I've traveled all over this country. I've traveled all over the world. I've been all over Europe, all over Africa, all over the Middle East, and I never met a Christian. I never met a Christian. I've probably visited over 50 different states in all these different continents all over the world. And I never met a Christian. I never saw a move of God. I never saw a beacon on top of a hill. I never saw a light that could not be hidden. But thus is the church, brethren. The glorious church. The glorious church, brethren. And even the heathen will hear this song. Amen. Amen. They will hear it, brethren. Because Jesus Christ said that He established the church that it would be a city on a hill that cannot be hid. It will not be hid, brethren. It will not be hid. Not this salt. This tasteful salt that will be scattered all over the world that shall not be trampled under foot of men. Not these people, these last days, glorious church, this beautified bride, brethren, as the ripeness of iniquity grows into maturity, when God is about to reap this vine of, of the earth and of the heathen sinners and cast them into the winepress of God, brethren, God is maturing His people. God is maturing His bride. God is enlarging us that we might understand His ways and know His thoughts and be prepared by many days of preparation to be endued with power from an eye to fulfill these prophecies, brethren. And if it doesn't happen with us, it's going to happen with somebody else. This glorious King shall come. He shall forerun the world before this great calamity of perilous times. He shall forerun the world with a move of Almighty God. And what's so amazing to me, brethren, in, in, in Rev Romans chapter 11 Verse 31, it said, through the Gentiles receiving mercy, the Jews are going to receive mercy. Brethren, there's going to be such an unleashing 
of the mercy of God in redemptive power right now in our lives and in the lives of the lives of the saints to come so that the Jews themselves will be compelled to believe in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise. Uh, brethren, this is, this is amazing. Everything that, that's been read so far, you probably read over Isaiah 24 and you never saw it. You never put two and two together. Wait, does that say see to see? Does that say all throughout the aisles? Does that say all around the Lord? They're singing of the majesty of God. And you realize now, heaven and earth will pass away. This will be fulfilled word by word, brethren. Word by word. This glorious move of God. This is this midnight cry. This waking up of God's sleeping people. This sanctity of the wise virgins. And Daniel speaks of this over and over and not only Daniel, but other prophets. But I want to show you a few passages in Daniel. Daniel chapter 11, 31 through 35. Daniel chapter 11, 31 through 35. It says, an arm shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolation. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And they shall understand among the people, and shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword, and by the flame, and by captivity, and by spoil many days. Hallelujah. Now when they shall fall, they shall be helping with a little help. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> but many shall cleave unto them with flatteries. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white. Praise God. Even to the time of the end because it is yet for a time appointed. Amen. Brethren, beloved of God, this is glorious. In Matthew 24 it said, Many shall be offended, many false prophets arise, and the love of many shall wax cold. But this says right here, that the people that know their God shall be strong and do exploits and that they shall understand and instruct many people, brethren. It says many. Amen. Many people, brethren. There will be thousands. An untold company from all over this, this world, every nation, tribe, and tongue. Many, brethren, shall be turned to righteousness because the exploits of God will compel them to, brethren. Hallelujah! The exploits right. of God. Right. Brethren, this will be an hour where men will see plagues of God's wrath come crashing down upon them. And brethren, beloved, nothing will get their attention. Nothing will get their attention unless they see the right hand of the Lord. And it's going to happen, brethren. It's going to happen. We know more than this. Turn to uh, Daniel chapter 12. Verse 1 through 3. And at that time shall Michael stand, stand up. The great prince was standing for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them shall sleep in, that, in the dust of the earth, shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame, and everlasting contempt. And they that be wise, shall shine as the brightness of the firmament. And they that turn many to righteousness, as the stars forever and ever. Amen. Brethren, the church that you see in the New Testament, was not silenced, was not unknown, was not unimpactful, was not without trouble to the heathen, 
They were an alarm, a sounding cry, an inescapable light, a confronting force that caused the heathen powers themselves to be utterly staggered and amazed at the living Christ. That was his first coming, brethren. That was his initial work of redemption. We're about on the edge of his consummating work, his second return, the most glorious work of redemption that shall ever be. We're on the verge of it. And brethren, beloved, this is the, this is the very key of embracing tribulation. Is when you look into the window of prophetic revelation and you gaze upon the scenery of the coming tribulation, if you see the glory of Christ and a glorious church shaking the world, causing songs to rise, purifying the church of God, waking up the sleeping remnant, and men and women doing exploits before the heathen brethren. And that's what you live for. For you and I, this is a happy time. This is a happy time. Because you desire to live for nothing else. The key of enduring to the end in the midst of betrayal of the brotherhood, in the midst of the name of God being blasphemed, is being grounded in the assurance that though many betray and many in their love wax cold, the church of God will be strong and do exploits. And the name of Christ will be glorified and the bride of Christ will be beautified. If there has been anything that has gotten me through with endurance against the betrayal of many brethren, it has been the confidence of seeing in the Spirit this coming move of God by which all the elect shall be sanctified and beautified and made ready for Christ's return. This end time move of God will be preached in the emphasis of the bride being prepared. In Revelation chapter 19 verse 7, it says, His wife has made herself ready. Brethren, this hour will be the hour when all of God's people are utterly conscious and deeply aware of the attributes uh, by which they will be prepared and found faultless and blameless and without offense and spot and wrinkle in glory and in holiness before the second coming of the Lord at Judgment Day. And this, brethren, mind you, is the doctrine in which the virgins of God stand right now in oblivion of and are fast asleep to these things that would wake them up. Brethren, these things should alarm you to a sense of responsibility, to an acknowledgement in your heart as Peter was upon, upon the holy mountain who said, it is good for us to be here. This should give you a sense of holiness and humility and worship before God that you are right now standing as a part of this end time work of God. And that this has been, been begun by the Lord and this will not be stopped by any man, nor any betrayal. God. This will not be stopped by any Judas, nor any friend, nor any backslider. Amen. Brethren, what is going to happen is going to be by the unfathomable power of God. All these prophecies that I've addressed those thus far, though they are amazing, though they are amazing, brethren, there's something else that we need to see. Turn to Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 through 7. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 through 7 speaks of the gospel being preached by a holy angel flying in heaven. Revelation 14, 6 through 7. 
And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of this, this judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of waters. A brethren, to somebody who doesn't know much about the book of Revelation or about the end times, who's just maybe versed in some of the beginning books of the New Testament, the first question they would ask themselves is, how is this the gospel? It's said there in Revelation 14 there that the angel had the everlasting gospel to preach and that he's flying in heaven and that he's preaching to the nations of the earth. And what does he say? He has an everlasting gospel to preach and all of the elements of his message are causing the people to acknowledge and fear God that He is Creator of the elements of the earth. Why? Why is that the Gospel? Why does the last day's message of the Gospel come in such a form? Well, brethren, there's more we know. By God's grace and wisdom through prophecy in Revelation chapter 11. It's drizzling pretty hard now, so I'm going to expound it by memory as much as I can. In Revelation chapter 11, it speaks of the two witnesses, as we've addressed this passage many times. But if you notice, these two witnesses, they're called the lampstands, the olive branches, prophesied in Zechariah, that are standing before the Lord. The same thing that is described as the churches of God in the book of Revelation chapter 2 and 3. We know not if they're two people or two churches or a remnant. I personally believe that they will most likely be two people. And there also is a remnant. Blessed be the name of God. And the remnant is actually spoken of in Revelation 11:13 of giving glory to God after the great earthquake when the two prophets are, ra prophets are raised from the dead and caught up into heaven before the eyes of the people. But there's something that needs to be seen, brethren. There's something that is shocking about this prophecy. There's something deep in the, in the heart of God and the mind of God that this world has never seen that's being manifest right now in that time. These two prophets... I believe, according to Romans chapter 11, verse 11, and Romans chapter 11, verse 31, that they will be Gentiles. I believe they will be Gentiles because the Apostle Paul said, through the mercy of the Gentiles, the Jews will come to believe. And through the Gentiles, they will be provoked to jealousy. I believe the two witnesses in Revelation 11 will be Gentiles because they will prophesy in Jerusalem and in the holy city wearing sackcloth like an Old Testament prophet. And it's mainly, brethren, through their prophesying that I believe that the Jews will be prepared and a remnant will be wrought upon and they will be made jealous and envious at the mercy that's upon the Gentiles. But why? What is so compelling about these two witnesses that makes it undeniable to a Jew that the God of Israel is with these two Gentiles? Brethren, these two men, they are prophesying of curse, not blessing. They are prophesying of plague, not healing. They are prophesying of destruction, not pools of water in the wilderness. They are prophesying of death, not resurrection of the dead. Brethren, these two prophets, 
by their prophesy, all of the world is going to come to hate them and know who they are. These two prophets, by their prophesy, is going to prophesy something that gets the attention of the entire world and convinces them that in the power of these two prophets is all the plagues that are coming upon us. They're going to look at these prophets and say, it's by their power that they're turning water to blood, that they're shutting up the heavens that it doesn't rain. Whithersoever they will, the plagues are coming. Brethren, why? Why is the world persuaded of this? I believe, brethren, these prophets are going to arise sometime before in the, in, in the midst of the Great Tribulation. And I believe that they are going to prophesy the coming plagues of the tribulation as they come. And I believe they're going to say such things like, there's going to be a locust plague in Egypt. There's going to be a stars falling from heaven in Russia. There's going to be, uh, uh, there's going to be wars in this country. There's going to be an earthquake here and there. And they're going to prophesy word for word the coming plagues that are coming upon the earth. So much so, the whole world comes to the consciousness that these men, these two men, are in connection from all the tribulations that are coming on the earth. And brethren, this is what the Old Testament prophets did. They wore sackcloth, brethren. They would prophesy to heathen kingdoms of the coming judgments word for word. They would declare the fate of surrounding nations before it came. Brethren, with two prophets that are Gentiles, wearing sackcloth, performing all the, the miracle plagues and destructive plagues of the Old Testament of Elijah and Moses combined, while at the same time, in the midst of the Great Tribulation, preaching everything before it comes to pass and preaching Jesus Christ, second return imminently upon the world that they need to wave the white flag of surrender and find peace because they're in the hour of tribulation and his vengeance is on the horizon. Brethren, it will be undeniable to the common Jew that the God of Israel is somehow with these two Gentile men. When they see all the pl plagues of Moses and Elijah combined, when they see their dress when they see the, the miracles of God perfectly in simulation to the Old Testament prophets and beyond, and yet they're Gentiles preaching Jesus Christ in the midst of it. Brethren, there's going to be a midnight cry. And everyone's going to wake up. Even the foolish virgins. But it will be too late for them. Now, brethren, this is amazing. This is something that you need to take time to contemplate. These prophets were not offended at the judgments of God. I spent the first part of this sermon declaring to you the coming judgments. And the title of this message is Embrace Tribulation. That means, in other words, embrace judgment. That is a rendition of the message of Jeremiah, which was embrace Babylon. Brethren, these two prophets and the last day saints of the great tribulation will be those that know their God, namely in his attributes of judging the world for its wickedness. And that it is the mercy of God. That the church of God and its backslid in the state deserves these judgments and needs these judgments to be purified and made white. That these judgments are the very mercy of God to us. That these judgments are a delight to endure because we can be fixated in amazement at the glory of God. Not in the entertainment of our transient lives. This is the glory of the last day's saints. A brethren, in that hour, this is, I don't know when these two witnesses are going to come. 
I don't know how they're going to come and how swiftly these birth pangs are going to keep coming upon us. We're in the beginning of sorrows right now. We are not in the last generation yet according to prophecy. We cannot be confident of that. Even now when the word of the Lord comes and prophetic utterances come and revelations come, we are still in a day where they can be held back. When God's word can be changed. When repentances can be found in the heart of God. Brethren, it says in 2 Peter chapter 3 that final judgment and the second return of Christ is going to tarry. And God is going to wait for the repentance of His people. That means that the judgment that's coming can be stalled and will be stalled. By prayer, by intercessors, even by holy angels. An example of this is in Genesis 19 where the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah was stalled until Lot escaped Sodom and Gomorrah. They said, we cannot do anything until you get out of here. And they waited. While he lingered, they hurried him. So will the cry of the midnight cry. We will be those, those messengers of mercy to a people on the verge of consummation pleading with them to rise up and cease from lingering, and believe the Word of God, and prepare for a second coming, and acquaint yourself with His judgment, and look not behind me. Don't get carried away with marrying, and giving in marriage, and eating, and drinking, and having a merry time. Like the days of Noah, and the end came upon them, and no one was ready, and the door of salvation was shut, and they went to that door, of that closed up ark of salvation, and they scratched upon the doors, and they pounded upon the wood, and they cried the name of Noah, and they cried the name of the families, and they cried and pounded, and they tried to climb up it. And the door of salvation was shut. People killing each other, fighting one another just to get the highest part of ground. It was a brutal time. It was a people who were suddenly surprised by a judgment that came like a thief. Thieves come under the element of disguise. That disguise will be a delusion. That delusion will come upon those who don't watch and pray. Thieves come under the element of surprise. God says those who are not prepared, those who are not watchful and praying, those who do not know their God, those who are not prepared to do exploits, those who are not acquainted with the coming judgment, brethren, they will be surprised. And what is their surprise? They will be surprised finding that they were self-confident and deceived, having a false sense of security. And all of their hopes and dreams were robbed from them in one moment of time. They had a false sense of security. And the Lord Jesus came and He was not their friend but their enemy. They had a false sense of security. A false sense of peace. Such delusions we need to escape, brethren. I believe this is why the Lord has led me to preach on the age-ending revival series. And there's several more that are related to it and coming in that series. Where I have acquainted myself with the attributes of, the, of Christ in His, in His judgments in the Old Testament, in His first coming, in His second coming. And that has acquainted my heart with this aspect of God, whereby He has a fan in His hand and He thoroughly purges His threshing floor by baptisms of fire. For in His mercy He inflicts, and in, in His mercy He wounds. And that it is for salvation. And thus Isaiah 24 says, Wherefore glorify ye the Lord in the fires. That's what it says, that song. That song of those people all around the world. He's saying, Wherefore glorify ye the Lord in the fires. 
these people are understanding that these afflictions are the good hand of the Lord. All these people that are deceived in unconditional eternal security, who are sleeping, who are loving the world and being attained with all this, this carnality and wickedness, who don't know anything about the church of God and the purity of the bride and the glory that's absent, that's departed from the church of God, and they're not praying and mourning, they're not poor and afflicted brethren. They will be surprised by judgment, by the coming Lord Jesus Christ, surprising them from their false sense of eternal security. They will be surprised. But not all. Some will fear. Why, brethren? In Revelation chapter 14, 6 through 7, did the angel of God preach the everlasting gospel in these terms? Fear God and give Him the glory. For He made all these things from the springs of the waters to the seas, to the land, to the trees, all the creation. He made all these things. Why, brethren? Because the very elements of creation were rending at the seams. The very heavens themselves were decaying and waxing old like a garment. Stars are falling from the sky. The springs of the waters are being poisoned. Pestilences are going across the land. Just all kinds of diseases and people are dropping dead left and right. And people are thinking all kinds of evil thoughts of blasphemy against the living God. And as a byword of their blasphemy, they're spewing out all their false philosophies saying, you know, carbon dioxide does this, the human have done this, we need to kill more humans, we need to do this and that, we need to start global warming. They would do all these other explanations about why what's coming upon us is coming upon us. But according to the word of God, the gospel, the good news is, is that God is doing these things. And they are the pangs of his second coming, with it, which is final salvation. The dawn of the millennial kingdom. These are the pangs, the judgments, the smitings of God upon a deserving people. Starting firstly with the church and the heathen around them. Brethren, beloved of God. The first century Christians spent a lifetime preaching and verifying that the Messiah was who He was by quoting Old Testament prophecy, speaking of the deaf hearing, the blind seeing, the dead being raised, the lame walking, the leprous people being cleansed, and all these different aspects of redemptive power that were unleashed upon the people in the first century. It was when quoting verses like these, and many others, that they verified that Jesus Christ was the Messiah. It was their duty, it was their job, to cause all people everywhere to come to the consciousness that because He did these things, He is the Messiah. Brethren, these last day saints must be so acquainted with the attributes of God's coming judgment and the anger that he has against sin, real sin, that we need to learn to abominate before the eyes of the common public. That we need to learn to vindicate that this is the very hand of the God himself in the Messiah who's on the throne, who's ready to return. We need to be so acquainted with these things, brethren, that our message is vindicating that these plagues are from the hand of the Messiah. That these curses are from the hand of the Messiah. The pestilences are from the hand of the Messiah. And you should embrace it because there is no escaping it. And it shall only get worse. And you should hide yourself in the wrath of the Lamb. Hide yourself from the wrath of the Lamb. Hide yourself. And you preach the gospel. Brethren, do you see how the message of the last days is altered from the message in the first century? Do you see how the, 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 the very evidence is that we will be called to confirm as a validation that this is the Messiah are different than the first century. Thus, brethren, we need to study these aspects of our Christ. We need to acquaint ourselves with Him and agree with Him in our hearts that this is good. That this is good. 
This is His mercy and salvation. And it's through these fires we shall be purified. And without them, shall be lost. Brethren, there is a shift in the mind of God that's happening in this time. And I believe during this shift, He's turning His eyes from the Gentiles to the Jews because the Gentiles has overwhelmingly forsaken Christ. I don't know the order of all things. I cannot know it. Except God reveals some part way glimpse of what's to come. Except for the Scriptures. I do believe it's still in the heart of God to heal the sick and raise the dead and cleanse the lepers and cast out demons. I do believe that will come possibly first. And that endowment will be the first thing upon the conscience of God's backslidden people in the Gentile church worldwide. But after the overwhelming rejection, and then a remnant plucked out of the wise virgins, and days of preparations being fulfilled, and the acceleration of, of the, the apocalyptic plagues of the judgment of the last time, sometime during that time, brethren, the mind of God is going to change. And it's not going to be any more the time of healing and mercy. And we're going to visit the sick brethren. And they're going to be dying. And we're going to preach to them to glorify God in the fires. That you're under the hand of Almighty God. And He told us before that this would come to pass. And the wickedness of the world is great. And vindicate the plagues by abominating sin. And appealing to them to find refuge in the Son of God who suffered and died for them. That will be the message, brethren. It has shocked me, brethren. It awakened me. I did not even recognize that this will be the preaching, the predominant preaching of the last days. It didn't dawn upon me how much we need to prepare to preach this Christ and vindicate this Christ. To a world offended at Him. To a church offended at Him. We need to be prepared to vindicate this Christ. To be as those who embrace judgment. Embrace tribulation. Because therein is life and obedience to Christ. And endurance under the strength of His mighty hand. Brethren, there is a profound thing when it says, The wise shall understand, but the wicked shall not understand. One of the reasons I preach this sermon, brethren, it's an appeal that we would give ourselves to study, that we might understand. That we'd give ourselves to meditation and prayer of these things, that we might understand. This is not a message of judgment imminently coming upon us right now. This is a message, a call for preparation, a call to agree in your heart with the living Lord Jesus to what's going to come upon us through study, through renewing our minds according to the Scripture that we might be able to prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The Lord calls us to discern the season, brethren. To know our God. To do exploits. He has given us a nail in His holy place. A space and a time for the lighting of, enlightening of our eyes. We might be prepared to stand in that final day. We're privileged, brethren. We're greatly privileged. To be where we are right now. 
We are greatly privileged. God be praised, brethren. Let's give Him the glory. Let's give Him the glory who created everything. In whose power is all these plagues. Let's be ready to stand with those two witnesses. To be scattered all over the world and preach, vindicate the name of Christ. Turn many to righteousness. Let's be ready, brethren. No other, no other creature on earth can preach, brethren. Humans can't. We need to preach. Know our God and preach Him. The day will come. Let's prepare for it.